Welcome back to Buffalo Times. I'm Nancy Shade, and we're up in the Golden Means Studio Gallery where I do my paintings and sculptures. And it's a great place to be able to be interviewing with Sean Fielder, who is Hardwick Town Manager for how many years, Sean? Be approaching two in January. January. Two. So you had yeah. one, one year and a few months, yeah. and then the COVID hit. Yeah, it was, uh, it was almost a full year of operations. And uh, as you pointed out, um, mid-March, we had the state of emergency kick in with the uh, pandemic. And it, uh, it's obviously created some pretty challenging times for all of us, whether in the business front or personal front, family front. Um, just there's a lot to be dealing with these days. So I guess it just comes with the job, whether, whether you're managing a town or a business or your family. It's been a lot of unique challenges that we have all faced. Is there anything you'd like to tell uh, the town at this moment about where we are, uh, where we are with the COVID, and what you uh, hope that they will be aware of? Anything in particular? Well, I guess what I would start out with is that the um, we have been making our best efforts um, on the town end, uh, meaning town clerk's office, town managers, all the employees to. Uh, just react as best we can to a lot of state guidance that has been coming uh, in regards to how our operations have been impacted and uh, doing our best to keep services coming to the community members. Um, you know, I think about, um, I came into town uh, one day in late March um, and it was about 7.30 in the morning and it's the first time that I'd experienced something like this. I, I literally came into town Got to the blinking light, uh, and I live in Woodbury, um, just across the uh, town line. Um, so I'm coming in every day from Woodbury. And from the time that I had driven in from my place, uh, which is about eight miles from the downtown area, uh, until I got to the blinking light, I did not pass another vehicle. When I got to the downtown blinking light, again, this is the end of March, there was not a car parked on the street. And I sat there for two or three minutes and just thought, oh boy, this is not good, right? And um, you know, that was at a time when the stay-at-home uh, recommendations were on and essential workers were the ones that were uh, you know, keeping two things. And um, what, I, what I think is really good for town's folks to hear is that um, you know, we, we're coming through this time period. You know, we're here in the middle of August 2020 and we're still dealing with the pandemic. I think the state of Vermont has uh, done a decent job of uh, protecting public health with some of the actions they've taken. I think it goes without saying that we've got some pretty significant impacts, you know, to the economy that we're still, we are dealing with now and we are going to be dealing with. But back to your main question in regards to, uh, you know, what folks should hear. Um, I want to just put a, a shout out and a compliment out to our, our employees who, you know, we consider our employees essential. They were in that category and they adapted and adjusted to the best of their ability to keep the services going. And, uh, you know, we can't stop plowing our roads. We're still seeing snow at the start of the state of emergency. We can't keep servicing, providing police services. You know, we're continuing to do that. We have to get prepared for elections. You know, those things happen months in advance of the primary that occurred yesterday. yesterday. So, uh, you know, the various offices um, basically have had to do quite a bit of a, a business operations adjustment and um, you know frankly i'm pretty proud of everybody at the town level at the employee side and board and committee side too it's not just about our employees select board has had to adapt how we've gone about you know they've gone about holding their meetings the various commissions and committees in towns it's been the same they've had to adapt in particular you know everything is face to face up until this point now we're going to Zoom and other online and conference call meetings. And uh, in some instances, that has not been done before. So there's a lot to catch up on and adapt to. And uh, I think all in all, we've done a good job. So, Is there anything the townspeople can do to help you? Um, you know, I, uh, the way I think about my position and the way that, um, you know, what I'm, I'm trying to model is, look, we're here to provide service to the community. So, you know, as far as uh, citizens providing anything back to us, I guess just, um, you know, if you, if you need any service moving forward, then let us know. Continue to do that. Do it in a respectful manner. Um, I guess I would shift it from, is there anything you can do for, uh, you know, uh, town manager's office or the employees to be thinking about how maybe you can help your neighbor. 
Are you thinking about how maybe you can help the local business that's in our community? Um, if how we, is the food shelf? The food shelf early on in the process uh, was, was extremely busy. The director there, you know, had relayed that um, to my office and to other community contacts. Something that I think has been very uh, positively significant for Hardwick and the surrounding area is the neighbor to neighbor group, the Hardwick neighbor to neighbor group. Um, I know they've been extremely active. There's been a lot of volunteers put a lot of, putting a lot of energy into this process. I know my neighbor Val Hussey, I saw her yesterday at the elementary school yep. handing out um, food for people. Yep. And I just wondered um, if the contributions are coming in. Well, I'd have to defer, obviously, to the um, executive director and the folks that run the food shelf, but I, I think it would probably go without saying that there are some demands for food and, you know, essential services. So if, you know, if people are in a position to assist, uh, you know, you can check through the Hardwick Neighbor to Neighbor group, and there are a lot of opportunities, whether you want to provide a service or financial donation or a food contribution. The neighbor to neighbor group is uh, in a good position to help coordinate really what they were trying to achieve out of the gates with that particular group was if there's a need in the community, let's make sure that that need is met. So oftentimes in situations like this, and I mean to say the pandemic, which uh, I mean it is unprecedented, we haven't dealt with this for a hundred years. Never. And um, you know, oftentimes in a situation like this, um, you know, Vermonters and generally speaking, uh, folks in our country, they'll step up to the plate and they'll try to help if they can. Um, I think what's interesting is I think, I, I know I've, I've experienced a couple of situations, uh, you know, most recently, I guess, with Irene and the situations caused by that storm. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes Vermonters are not willing to ask for help, right? So uh, I think that, it, you know, if you need help, you got to ask for it. And then I think what's good to say uh, on this point is Hardwick Neighbor to Neighbor Group is really trying to ensure if we've got some resources. Let's make sure they're allocated to help out people in the area. And I, the town supported that initially. Uh, my office supported that, town manager, um, which, uh, you know, we have an operating budget to work with, which obviously is coming through the tax rates that are set. The citizens are helping to run the operations in town, of course. We took a small allocation, a very small allocation out of an emergency line item, which you know, is a perfect category. This was an emergency situation. And we helped with um, the neighbor to neighbor group, did a postcard mailing to every mailing address that they had for Hardwick, Hardwick Town residents, put a postcard right in everybody's mailbox to say, here's how you can get information and or provide a resource to the neighbor to neighbor group. That's excellent. How, how did you, how did you, um prepare to become a town manager? Um, I, I don't think it was necessarily by design um, how I ended up in the role uh, prior to being um, a, a, lucky enough to be assigned to the position. I was an executive director for a trade association that did water and wastewater training uh, all over the state of Vermont. We uh, provided service to uh, various uh, communities including the town of Hardwick. So I had prior uh, prior to uh, learning about the job opportunity, done some work on uh, water and uh, wastewater system work. In Hardwick? In or? Hardwick, actually, yeah. Where is the water coming from now? Um, it, the water in Hardwick, we have uh, drilled wells off uh, Wilkett Street, uh, south, uh, basically the east end of Wilkett Street. And um, those wells then pump to our uh, Bridgman Hill Reservoir and also uh, Glenside Reservoir. Mm -hmm. And then from there going out to the distribution network. It's good water. Yeah, the quality is good, and um, you know, it's uh, it's something that we are constantly trying to make improvements on. Uh, early on in my job assignment, which was uh, I came on board in January of 2019. Unfortunately, we had a catastrophic situation with the Bridgman Hill Reservoir, where the roof caved in due I, to I some wind and snow load. So that was a little bit challenging dealing with that situation. I can imagine. But um, you know, as it goes. Uh, when it, just my tactic is if, if you have a situation like that, no different than what we're dealing with with the pandemic right now, you just put your best foot forward and work on the issue and try to resolve the problem. And, How you know, was you do it your resolved? Best. So on, on that situation, uh, we immediately had to uh, isolate the reservoir to make sure, um, you know, as you can imagine, with the roof caved in, the quality of the product cannot be guaranteed. You have to keep it clean, if you will. Mm -hmm. So we immediately moved to an isolation procedure 
and then per the Safe Drinking Water Act guidance, uh, put ourselves on a boil water order, notified all the citizens, did uh, press releases, did uh, radio announcements, uh, did postings on Front Porch Forum, got the word out. And then after uh, um, you know, a significant amount of time and effort, we had to jump into, okay, we're in a position where we have to make a repair and it's a significant capital cost. Let's go ahead and move forward on those steps. Interestingly enough, the prior to the incident of the roof failing, uh, this was just in advance of town meeting in 2019. There was a bond vote for this particular project. Mm -hmm. We didn't expect the roof to cave in, no. of course, but there was a bond vote in the works. So uh, why I point this out is uh, uh, my observation is that the town, uh, the select board, the people planning these processes for a number of years prior to my assignment as the town manager, have done a nice job on their recognizing the capital improvements that do need to be taking place. And, uh, you know, something like this is a very significant cost. It's just less than half a million dollars to repair this roof. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And uh, the town um, and uh, select board, the operations folks involved prior, had been thinking about this for some time and not unique to this particular piece of infrastructure, but the town is good about let's be setting a little bit of money aside now so we can be building up on what we anticipate having to replace in the pre, uh, future, excuse me. And, um, you know, we did have to, we are gonna have to, uh, you know, we'll close on some financing for this project, but due to some grant opportunities through Department of Environmental Conservation and due to some of this previous capital planning, the overall costs are not going to be a significant impact to an individual user. I mean, the cost on a yearly basis to get this project completed is about 10 bucks a year for a given connection. So I know $10 a year can be a lot for some budgets, but generally speaking for the improvement that we're getting, and it is done, it's a turnkey project as of now. Congratulations. Yeah, I think that... That's uh, good news. It is good news. And uh, I'm firmly convinced we've got a piece of infrastructure there that will last 75 or 100 years, quite honestly. So and we're what in about the position. library? How, did that pass? Did the that library go bond vote did pass. Oh, it did? Yep. Oh, and good. Uh, in addition, great. we had a fire truck bond vote that also no, passed. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so boy. those both have passed. Um, what will they do with the old fire truck? Um, I don't know if the, the old fire truck, of course, will come out of service, and I would have to defer to the fire chief, who Tom Fadden is our highway uh, director, Fadden, yeah. but Tom is also the fire chief. I suspect uh, there isn't a lot of value there, just given the condition of it, so they may sell it outright uh, or go to an auction process, or maybe somebody could use it just generally as a water hauler or something like this. You know, oftentimes on a piece of infrastructure like that, there's not a lot remaining in the uh, value, if you will. Yeah. On the library, if I could just comment on that, um, I know uh, a lot of folks have been working really hard on the library project, and um, you know what's uh, this? This news just came out this last week, actually, uh, just in advance of the bond vote. The Vermont Department, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Vermont office, mm -hmm. uh, is actually supplying, or we got the word notification of a community facilities grant to help uh, support the project. And um, it's uh, just above $150,000 grant, which is pretty significant amount of money, of course. Uh, the other thing that I think is very significant is there have been a lot of folks in the community and beyond that have provided financial support. They've donated for this particular project. So, uh, you know, obviously there's some costs on these things. Um, the trustees and staff have been working hard on this to have a, you know, what is hopefully going to be perceived as a reasonably priced project and something that will be valuable for the community moving forward. And, and what about housing in Hardwick? How is yeah. that going? It seems like Church Street is being gradually um, repaired and brought up to standard yeah. housing. Um, I don't know. Um, a lot of the buildings are, are, have been bought. I don't know. Yeah, exactly I, how that's coming about, but sure. it's really looking good. Yeah, and I, um, I don't have, you know, the actual statistics as far as, you know, occupancies versus non-occupancies and, mm -hmm. and things like this. Um, I think generally speaking, um, there, you know, we're seeing uh, a lot of activity on uh, various housing projects. Not, you know, it, it's a little bit checked up right now with the pandemic situation because, mm -hmm. you know, there are, there's, uh, folks are a little bit hesitant about what is going to happen with the economy moving forward. 
But, that's um, very true. Yeah, it's it's just the reality of where we're at these days. Yeah. Uh, this being said, we're you know we are seeing some things continuing, and um, I know uh, Lamoille Housing Partnership has done a lot with their partners on improving some of the downtown uh, housing blocks. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, frankly, I uh, the Hardwick downtown area, the Village area. Um, if you look at East Hardwick, you know the improvements there. Um, you know, everybody is. Uh, there's a lot of positive things happening, I guess, is what I would say. How about the old bank? I mean, is that, will that become offices eventually? Or I know I, it's really hard to address yeah. these things because, right. because of the pandemic. Yeah, um, so with the, uh, with the bank building um, on, uh, I guess that'd be Mill Street, um, there, there recently was a purchase of the property, that was last year. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I'm not sure the exact plans of the new owners, but, um, uh, I, my, what I hear on the street is there's some intent to maybe add a restaurant in the future, but again, that's going to be what the new owners decide. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they were uh, what I had heard, and again, I have not had a direct conversation with the new property owners, but, uh, and this, I guess, isn't a comment about that particular real estate transaction, but the, the fact of the matter is that Hardwick has uh, some really positive things happening over this past couple year period that are it's drawing interest and in people, uh, businesses are uh, doing well, you know, being based here and um, visitors are drawn to the area. So we got a couple of really positive things working for us in regards to the economic side of things, right? Yeah, on the connection that we'll have with the walking path or the... Yeah, the rail that's, trail. That'll probably be within the next, the rail trail in yes. the next two or three years. That's a correct statement. Comple yeah. Completed, it'll take at least two. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the town of Hardwick, uh, here again, a positive story. The town of Hardwick has, uh, and I would call attention to Eric Rumick and pr uh, prior town manager John Jewett, who John had been working on some grants, and Eric has been pretty active on the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail for some time. And um, we are, uh, I'd mentioned the uh, Vermont Office of U.S. Department of Agricultural Rural Development prior, well, they've also supported this project. And... Uh, we're in the process now of, uh, we've got a bit, uh, contract that we're about to sign for some improvements on the section by our town highway garage area. Mm -hmm. In addition, we're, um, there's work occurring right now on the two bridges out to the eastern section, if you will, by Billy Farm Road and wow. um, just beyond in what we call the corners. Mm -hmm. Those bridges have actually been completed due, uh, due to an NBRC, Northern Border Regional Commission grant. That project's been Amazing. managed by our partners, uh, Vermont Association of Snow Travelers. Yeah, I noticed up so there. So we're gaining ground. You're gaining ground. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're, they're, the people up in Danville and West Danville, they, they really use that trail. Absolutely. I saw horses on it the other day. Absolutely. Like there were four horse horse people yeah, riding so on the trail. Yeah, so everybody is aware, the, um, you know, on the rail trail, the... The legislature, uh, you know, we know we're in a tough economic time, but the legislature, the governor had proposed in his address to the uh, state, to the legislature, a state of the state address or state of the budget address, whatever the correct term is. He did want to put some money toward the Lamar Valley Rail Trail. And uh, it's important to note uh, that the allocation did go through the legislature. It's, uh, it's about 2.6 million, I think is the correct number. I think a really important thing for folks to hear is with uh, the state of Vermont uh, using this 2.6 million, what it's going to leverage is over $16 million of federal money that's going to be able to be used so that in uh, what is being projected now at a two-year period, this will allow the entire 93 miles of the rail trail to be completed. It runs from St. Johnsbury to Swanton. And it's right behind the Yellow Barn. So That's correct what, statement. What, what is the future of the Yellow Barn? Do you have any uh, bead on that at all? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, as there, unfortunately there's a common theme here with the discussion today, and that is that, you know, with the pandemic, it's, it's checking up some things. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple of positives on the Yellow Barn. Uh, this spring, uh, the town and the project planners did secure a $3 million economic development. Uh, administration grant for this project so we uh, we were really excited about that yeah that's the cool. award notice came actually at the time when it was some of the most dire and worst news about where we were on the pandemic so it really was muted and you wanted to jump up and down and say <laughs> hooray and you just it was the timing wasn't right if you will yeah. So uh, on the project itself uh, we're we're at a point where we are evaluating um, uh, the costs and then working with the uh, potential folks who uh, uh, are going to be leasing the facilities 
and uh, we don't have those items finalized as of yet. We're, uh, you know, we're, we're undetermined in regards to when we're gonna have that information in order. And what we're talking about as a group right now is, you know, we're, we're striving to get uh, all these details nailed down so that we can get ourselves to construction, break ground process. Is that gonna be late fall? Is it gonna be next year? You know, we don't know for sure uh, with, with where we are on our construction cycle in the state of Vermont. Uh, I guess what we might anticipate is it's probably uh, practical to say, you know, best we're going to be able to do for breaking ground is sometime this next year. But I have to be careful when I make a statement like that because there's certain aspects of this project uh, that we could start to work on this fall. So there's a lot of folks working really diligently on this to move it forward. Um, I want to also offer this. It's, it's a very significant project for our area. Because um, you know it's projected at the three-year period to bring in 60 full-time jobs, and those jobs are also going to be supporting other businesses and you know putting more economy back in, if you will. And the Center for Agriculture, that's doing a lot too, isn't it? Yeah, the Center for Ag Economy is uh, one of the key partners on the project. So uh, John Ramsey is the executive director there, and he his group has been working diligently behind the scenes as well. And in effect, we're kind of co-applicants on this. I even have the finish for the, from the Meyer, yeah, Myers yeah, plant on this see. table. That's good to see This that. is something that was actually <laughs> really needed it. And I painted the product on this and it just is so stuff. amazing. It is. Well, so, the, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. We have, we have a few businesses in town that probably are suffering from this mm -hmm. COVID as well. Yeah. But the town looks great for summer. We have tables outside. We yep. have people can sit at a distance and be outside and the, sure. be the benches are helpful yeah. and the bridge has the flowers on it now because James Toysher finished the yeah, wrought good. iron holders. Yeah, they look nice. So everything is really, it's cheerful, really, in a way, when you drive through town and the inn has the, has the tables where people can sit in the evening and just observe the goings on. It, it seems like um, it's looking like a, friendly town it looks happy but underneath it i know that this mm -hmm. this pandemic is just hanging on and yeah causing a lot of economic hardship yeah the um you know the restaurant group actually uh, in regards to the tables you know the restaurant group a uh, group of the restaurant owners uh, got together and um you know they worked diligently in may uh, it was late april into may about you know what what can we do for the outdoor seating opportunities I think it's, this is a really key point. Um, I, uh, this isn't just about the restaurant group. If you think about um, you know, the other businesses that are in our downtown area, and uh, I keep saying downtown area, but um, you know, obviously there's businesses that aren't necessarily located right in that downtown area that are also uh, seek, uh, getting a benefit from you know, this economic activity continuing. Mm -hmm. It's really challenging if you think about uh, you know, one business in particular, I know the way the standard is now, that business, given their square footage, they effectively could have one patron in the store space at a time. Well, that, that's, you think about trying to run your business where you can only really interact with one person face-to-face -face at a time, you, you, you have to have volume. Right, you got to have these. You got to have the faces coming through. I know you do. The businesses have Definitely. been uh, adapting well and doing a lot of curbside. Mm -hmm. What I was going to say, uh, I think the key point is this: the restaurant group approached approached the select board. The select board said, "Look, let's work with the town. You know, work with Sean about what we can do on uh, let's let's try to you know get these outdoor seating spaces set up so that um, you know we're six feet apart. We're practicing the social distancing." If we can have a place that looks inviting and people want to stop and if they want to get a takeout meal or they want to buy a book or they want to see the antique shop, I mean, the list goes on and on, right? Whatever it is they want to do. If, if they want to, you know, if they need to go to the parts store, you know, whatever business they want to patronize in that area, we're, we're trying to invite them. There's a balance here, of course. We don't want to be overloaded because when you're overloaded and you get the crowds together, then it raises, okay, wh what are the concerns in regards to the exposure and transmission? Even with Vermont doing so well, it's something we still need to be thinking about. Where the flood zone is, that empty space, uh, it used to be the flood zone, they mm -hmm. called it, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's kind of a difficult sale yeah. But I would imagine if it were, maybe if we had a bulletin board there where people came into town, they could 
they could read and see what was available to them. In Woodstock, they've always had this bulletin board. Sure. And it's it's very helpful yeah. for people that go down to Woodstock and want to see what's happening. Right. There's not a lot happening right now. We don't have a movie theater or yeah. bowling alley or yeah. whatever. But um, it could be something that would help tourists a little bit. That's a good point. To understand where they could go hiking and where they would end up. There is the information board right on uh, Main Street. That's, um, I guess uh, it'd be... Uh, just, uh, I will say, west of where the co-op is. There's, it has the Hardwick Trails, and there's a little bit of information there. Oh, yes. But there isn't yeah, necessarily like right. a public You're board. You're right. That is a so good point. So there one. is a space where folks can get a little bit of information. Um, you know, putting the, the signage aside, um, yeah. my observation is I, I was in central Vermont last week, and I was in Burlington about three weeks ago. I was on the waterfront in Burlington. Mm -hmm. My parents and law are in that area, and we were visiting with them. The Burlington waterfront was extremely slow. I mean, so slow that it really struck me like, wow, this is really slow in regards to what's happening in activity and visitors mm -hmm. and very unlike what you see on the Burlington waterfront, of course. Oh, and yes. we know it's because of the pandemic. Right. I juxtapose that with, uh, I'm in central Vermont and a nearby community in the same, it's just really slow. And then um, I come, you know, in Hardwick, there is a, a reasonable amount of activity. That's how I would say it. You know, we'd like to see more to help out our businesses because obviously they're a significant part of the community and it's important we keep all of them moving forward. The point is that I saw a lot more activity here in Hardwick. I think, I think Hardwickians and those around are really trying to help support these businesses. A good friend of mine who I used to mountain bike with frequently I saw him uh, Sunday nearby where I live, and he made a point of saying, he also lives in Woodbury, he made a point of, of saying to me, well, we have been at least one time a week, you know, getting takeout from one of the restaurants, and, uh, you know, just trying to make sure we're doing our best to patronize those local businesses, and that's important. If mm -hmm. you have the resources to be able to do that, you should try. And in Vermont, in some ways, the reason people can stay home is because they're happy mm -hmm. with what the life they have at home. Yeah. And they've created some sort of activity that keeps them occupied. Yeah. But it is, it is uh, great to be able to go into town and do some things. Absolutely. And buy some food and have a coffee at the front seat or yep. what have you. Yep. But how do you, do fe how do you feel that you were actually, you are probably prepared to have a job like this. Sure. Um, but d a little bit of your own history sure. about what your experiences have been yeah. that have brought you into this very responsible job. So it, it, what I would start with is we're dealing with the pandemic and uh, a humble comment here. I don't think there's anybody that necessarily has the expertise or the tool set to fully deal with everything that is occurring around the pandemic. So just, just, a, just, a, just a thought um, to the root of your question. Um, I'd mentioned that I'd worked for a nonprofit association prior and I was the executive director there. Um, I, I, I grew up in central Vermont and um, most recently uh, I'd lived in Middlesex for uh, 25 plus years. And um, at that time living there, I was uh, moving up through the ranks at the previous firm where I became the executive director. A, a lot of management activities, you know, taking place as a part of that job. So, you know, when you say, well, where are management activities? Uh, you know, uh, managing personnel, managing policies, working with the board, uh, developing and overseeing budgets, uh, you know, just watching the bottom line. Obviously, the finances are a significant aspect of a business and you got to be keeping up with things. Building relationships, um, lobbying, uh, interacting with state, local representatives, uh, interacting with citizens and individuals needing support or assistance. Many of those same things are key aspects of the town manager's position. So the way that it had worked for me is that I already mentioned this, that I had worked in the town of Hardwick on some water and wastewater work. And something I'm really proud of actually is the, the previous firm I was with, um, I was actually, uh, I took on the lead role of doing an income survey for the community when they were evaluating doing the uh, West, uh, Church, West Church Street uh, waterline improvements and then also the Glenside Storage Reservoir. 
the results of those income surveys showed that uh, the median household incomes were below a certain threshold. I won't get into a lot of detail here, but the end point is this. It resulted in a $1.4 million subsidy for those improvements moving forward. So it was very significant financial benefit for the community. I had to work really closely with various personnel and interact with a lot of folks in the Hardwick area when that was occurring. And as I've said, I kept working, you know, as not every day, but often in Hardwick. And that's how I kind of found out about the job, actually. So, um, you know, what, what led me up to being prepared? I, you know, I didn't think uh, I actually have a, a degree in uh, physical geography, a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Vermont. I've got a Master of Arts uh, in Geography from the University of Minnesota. Somebody might think, well, wait, you're a geography. How did you end up in a management position? I guess by just some of those activities that I'd worked on over time, uh, it's just how it kind of worked out, if you will. And did your parents manage their household well? Did my parents? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of an interesting question, right? Um, so here's what I hone in on that. You know, both, well, managing uh, a home, you, you have know, to... Yeah. Um, so here's how I and answer maintaining that. Maintaining a home. It, There's a lot to it. Oh, absolutely. So um, that I'm, young children can learn. Oh yeah, I'm a first generation college graduate. So when somebody asks me how did your Isn't folks do, great? and I say my folks did great because I was a first generation college graduate, and Wonderful. we had you know pretty limited means growing up to be blunt, and just you keep working with what you got and do your best. That's and the best. So I, you know, I was. Yes. So the answer is yes. They did a good job. <laughs> so, you know, my own experience with this, I have two sons and that's the hardest job you will ever have for any, anybody that has children. They know that's, you know, works easy. Raising family, that's a whole different game. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so. But they're doing well. And yeah. You yeah. want to tell a little story about what happened out west well, to, the, uh, to it, your audience here? <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I was telling Nancy before we started talking today that um, as we speak, my, uh, my youngest son is uh, trying to get to uh, Colorado on a road trip. He's, he's also a college graduate and he's taking a little bit of a road trip to take a break. And as it turned out, uh, Monday of this week, there was a derecho windstorm it's referred to, which is basically a sheer wind, only it lasts for you know, up to an hour. And uh, he just happened to be at the epicenter of that in uh, Iowa. And, uh, and it was a hundred mile an hour. Yeah, they wind. had a hundred mile an hour gust at the airport and sustained at 90 miles an hour for about half hour, 45 minutes. So. He's having car problems, and then he's in the middle of a catastrophic event. And you know what? This is life. You you have to figure things out, and you're going to have situations like this. And this is why you travel, and this is what we all have to deal with. So you move forward. You know, it reminds me. Um, select board member uh, Elizabeth Dow said to me in first part of April, "You didn't sign up for this." You know, as far as coming on as the town manager, and you know my immediate unhesitated response, and this is in regards to the pandemic. No one signed up for this. No None one. Of us did. The whole world no did, did not sign no up did. for this. Right. And it is all over the world. This is the... Absolutely. This is why it's so different. It's I'm, everywhere. I'm, you know, what I'm trying to do, uh, you know, in regards to operations and, um, you know, we're, you know, this was, so March, which, so what are we, f we're basically five or six months in. And, um, I don't mean, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here, uh, negative, but, you know, we got some time to go. It's, uh, you know, I, my observation, and I updated our department leads and, you know, talked to staff uh, early on in the process, and I said, look, my observation is uh, this is going to be some time. And just, you know, Vermont has done very well, but it's not over. So be patient with the process. Try to do your best in regards to, um, you know, protecting yourself, protecting your family members. It's not going to be a perfect process. You know, we talked before we started the interview about, you know, do we have the masks on? Do we not have the masks on? We're six feet apart. You know, I'm. We're, I keep we're mine right on my arm just <laughs> in case. We're being careful. I mean, I'm constantly washing up. And is that right or wrong? You know, it, I guess time will tell. That's how I think about this. I, I had an individual contact me in April. Uh, who runs another facility in town, and you know they were they were just bouncing some things off me, and I said, well, here's how I think about this. Uh, we do have some guidance that we are obligated to follow. So let me hone in on just the the town uh, municipal operations. The state of Vermont has basically given us guidance, and we're effectively a business, and this is the guidance that we need to follow. 
So to the best of our ability, we're, we're trying to keep up on that guidance. He's um, done a really good job guiding us on the, during the week. Yeah. I mean, I listen to him, every, the, uh, the governor, yeah. um, every, every week. There's a, there's a heck of a lot of information to keep up with. And the doctor is excellent. Yeah, doctor, yeah. Uh, Dr. Levine's done a, done a good job. Dr. Levine. So I think what, uh, one of my observations is we're, there's going to be, there are disagreements about how this should be handled. That's a no. Uh, you know, obviously people are concerned about uh, how's the economy being impacted, and there's no doubt it is. Um, but, you know, if we can do some basic things, uh, so again, back to the operations, it's uncomfortable wearing a mask when you're working in the field when it's 90 degrees, mm -hmm. right? We yes. know this. It's yeah. uncomfortable. Okay, let's, if we can step back, keep our distance, assuming it's not a job where we need to be right next to each other, uh, we're hoping that's going to make a difference. And uh, I, I guess what I would close with is this, that some folks think that maybe that's a, uh, it's overly conservative uh, at, at the cost of the economy. I don't know. Who, who knows? We don't have the looking glass. And I guess what I think about is um, if we can make a difference and to the best of our ability, keep things functioning adequately and um, you know, keep, keep it moving um, economically. And we are limiting how many folks uh, health is impacted and you know, God, forbid, God forbid we start to get more deaths in Vermont. I think that's, you know, that's good from my perspective. Whether it's right or wrong, time will tell. And planning ahead. Yeah. Because it, it's difficult to plan ahead when you don't know if you're gonna have the costs of yeah, the that's, plan that's fulfilled. Been ex that's but, been an extremely challenging aspect of it. But to keep moving forward, nonetheless, yeah. Yeah. is what we really need to do. Yeah, and I, um, you sense when folks, um, this isn't just about the business side of things, and I think this is a really unique, this is, a, this is the challenge of a pandemic. It's not just at work, and then you go home and you don't have to deal with it. You're dealing with it at work, you're dealing with it in your personal life, you're mm -hmm. dealing with it in all your personal experiences. You don't get a break. You don't get a break. No. And uh, it's really interesting. Um, I know, um, you know, since this mid part of March when the state of emergency has been on, um, you know, I, I, I was considered an essential worker as well. And what all that means is I did keep reporting to the office to handle phone calls and, you know, just keep, keep some operations going. There was a two-week period where uh, I didn't even see department heads in person. It was phone call or, you know, online because we were just keeping our distance at that time. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you know, we can't really let up on that too much. No, I mean, it's because obviously, it's, it's let worked. up, it's worked, but uh, you know, compare what, you know, what I started with here a little while back of, you know, I come into town the end part of March and there's not any cars or persons on the street and everything is closed versus where we are out right now. The activity on face value, the activity would indicate that we're done with the pandemic. That's what's the challenging aspect of this discussion. That's right. I think what's really challenging for the state of Vermont is, uh, and this isn't news, you know, we're, we, we're a small rural state. The recreational economy is significant for our state. Well, we, and our construction season is significant for our state. If you mm -hmm. think about, there are a lot of people, and a lot of people in Hardwick, that their livelihood is general contracting, yeah. or mowing of a lawn, or painting, or you know, some outdoor business. We lost basically two and a half months of our construction season this year. So that, uh, we're, we're trying to catch up a little bit right now, right? Um, and it's something that has impacted how we've gone about things at the town operations level. We've had some significant projects that we basically have had to say, we have to put a hold on this until we see what's going to be happening. I understand. As an example, our, you know, our paving bids generally are out in April. As soon as we see the town budget go, uh, you know, we're getting our bids out. So come July 1st, which is our fiscal year start, we can move forward on these projects. We had to do a wait and see, right? We had to see how the property tax payments came. We had to see just generally what was going to be happening. Mm -hmm. So there are these fits and starts that are occurring. And I think all of us have to recognize we're going to have to be adaptable moving forward. The games, the rules are constantly changing. That's and the thing that's that challenging. And that we can even pay our taxes come yes, tax time. That is a correct statement. Some the, folks are in a position where that's a, that's a problem. The only puddle that I have a problem with <laughs> is the puddle in front of the Union Bank when you're <laughs> turning right into the Union Bank and you go bang into that puddle. And I asked the Union Bank, I said, hey, can you guys fix that, Mr. Silverman? Get him to get a little uh, 
stone in here or something. And no, it's not our problem. And then I went to the town, no, it's not our problem. It's a state problem. So <laughs> there are little things like that that yeah. just rub you the wrong way I once in a while. I understand. You know where I mean? Where yeah, you turn because, right, um, right into the, no, the, the Union so, Bank there. No, it's a I, I, big I understand hole. this. Uh, what you raise is the point that uh, even during a pandemic, there are still uh, improvements that need to be worked on, regardless of whose responsibility it is. There I know. Are still things I, that if need I to were improve. a man, I would get a pile of stones and shovel them right in there some night. Well, for the record, <laughs> it's not the town's responsibility, okay? No, it's not. It's <laughs> not. That particular location. Uh -uh. So. It is the state that I, I finally found that it was yeah, the state uh, that needed to do it. What I understand from uh, Tom Fadner, highway director, is uh, it, it looks like that stretch, the Wilkett Street stretch, this is one of the interesting, it's a unique aspect of you look at where our town boundaries are, you know, we have town controlled roads and we have state controlled roads. Uh, basically from uh, right near where you would turn to get into what is now the new Walgreens and um, you know, the, the, the grocery store center there, that's basically where the state controlled access is. And uh, what I understand is that particular section is uh, on the state's list to be improved in this next two year period. The Wilkes other, Street's always one of these that we get some calls on, and then when we say that's oh, state controlled, we still do try to help and hit some pothole, you know, improvements now and then. But the buildings that are abandoned, like yep. that little building between Walgreens and the new Eric's new ice cream stand, yep. you know that little building? Yeah, I do. What's what's the that's, bank owns um, it or the Walgreens? No, my understanding it? is the uh, the folks that own the Walgreens Plaza, that property, they also are the owners of that facility. So I wonder if they have any plans for it. That obviously would be a question that would have to be directed. Walgreens at them. is headquartered somewhere. I guess you have to call yeah. them out in yeah. Timbuktu or yeah. something. <laughs> and I, I, but, I don't know about the particular plans on that actual location. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just thought I'd mention yeah, those little questions that, that I'm no, curious fine. about yeah, from time to time. Oh, the other thing I was wondering, you know the water hole, is that in Woodbury or is it in Hardwick, where people go and get their water from the that's well? That's in Woodbury. That, that's in Woodbury. Yes, it, it would be Woodbury. nice to make it accessible in the, um, in the winters because I see people climbing over heaps of snow yeah. just to get their water. Yeah. And I just... Uh, I just thought I'd throw that in no, because it that. popped into my head. And yep. it could be really a beautiful um, place for people to go and get water. I mean, yeah, we could even do a year, fountain there access. and make, right. you know, in a heavy make snow a year, it, it, it is tricky to access in a heavy <laughs> snow year. I, I, I do go by that location every day. And of I course. worry about those old folks that are having to stumble through the snow to, and ice to get to their water. Yeah. A lot of people just love that water yeah. and they go for it. Yep. So. It's really been fun talking with you and Good. meeting you, Sean. I'm glad I had the opportunity. I appreciate you giving I, me an opportunity to offer a few comments. Yes, thank you. Hey, I thank appreciate you. your coming. And Good. I would like to do this more often with sure. you. Maybe if you ever need to have access or want to talk to people sure. about things, you're always welcome. And uh, all you have to do is let Kurt or myself know. Okay. And, you know, it is a time where, with the COVID, mm -hmm. where we, we really... We really we need comfort information once sure. in a while, so that we ha we know how to direct our our own personal yeah. finances and our own lives. Yeah, because uh, it is going to be changing in the next six months quite well, radically. I'm afraid. I think what I would it, it's one of these themes that I'm trying to continue with, and that is um, it, it, it's a I know it's a catchphrase, but people are going to have to be patient with the process. Yes. And uh, I think also, um, you know, I'm not perfect on this. None of us are, but patience. And I think the other important thing right now is uh, respect. It's, we're seeing, you know, there's some folks that are for masks. There's some folks that are opposed to masks. We shouldn't be arguing about that. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is put our energy into how can we resolve, you know, the coronavirus uh, incidents itself. Mm -hmm. You know, what... You know, let's let's well, put our energy toward this is the enemy, if you will. Right? And and you know something? It's almighty. Oh, yeah. It's the almighty mm -hmm. that we really need to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And we need the help to have the patience. Those who wait upon the Lord mm -hmm. will renew their strength. Yeah. And so we need to wait upon the Lord and hope and pray that 
uh, to Almighty God that this will pass. Help our neighbors is a key and phrase help right our there. Neighbors. Help your neighbors if you can. And, uh, you know, it, it, you look at those around you. Yeah, you're, you're going to have some issues at times, but there's other folks that uh, they're having issues as well. So uh, try to help each other here now is what's going to be important. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I'm glad I had a chance to chat with you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's it for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and gained some information about how to live through this time in a way that keeps us moving forward. Onward we go.